Hi. Um, yeah, so our next speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Uh, Levin uh, Wanderstepan from Delft University of Technology. And uh, Levin is, uh, I think he's generally interested in uh, quantum mechanics phenomena in nanoscale devices, the long term view of uh, uh, in quantum computing and simulation. And I think he's also very famous for the first demonstration of the surest quantum algorithm for, for factoring where he finds uh, 15 equals to three times five. And today he will talk about the analog quantum, uh, quantum simulating of uh, uh, Fermi Hubble or, uh, uh, physics uh, using the quantum dot arrays. And uh, I think uh, Levin, the floor is yours. Okay, well, thanks very much. Uh, thanks also, Shankar, for organizing this conference. It's really uh, nice to, to uh, participate and, and listen to all the talks. I've uh, been very much enjoying it. Um, so, so indeed, yeah, I'll, I'll you know, Similar to the to the uh, to many of the speakers today, I'm really interested and motivated by trying to find ways to get more insight, learn about Fermi Hubbard physics, uh, as well as spin models. Which, of course, in the end, uh, many spin models are, are are a limit of the Fermi Hubbard uh, model. Um, and um, you know, it, it's it's really one of the important open problems in condensed matter physics and anything that we can do to to uh, understand better the properties, I think is really, is really um, worthwhile. Now, um, you know, as we've heard, and as we will hear also in the next talk, there is this phenomenal uh, line of research studying Fermi Hubbard models, uh, also spin models, uh, based on ultra cold atoms in optical lattices, uh, you know, already for 20 years, one, one um, spectacular result after the other. More recently, uh, really interesting work with optical tweezers. There's of course also the uh, very exciting digital quantum simulation experiments um, led by the chat eye and the superconducting qubit uh, community. But altogether, I think it's fair to say that, that as we are uh, progressing, you know, it's, it's really um, um, worthwhile to investigate different methods of, pro of probing the same physics that offer complementary ways of um, constructing the models as well as probing the models. And perhaps also uh, even accessing accessing different regimes in parameter space, and so the the physical platform that I've been working on for the past past twenty years, primarily motivated by the prospect of building uh, quantum computers, and I will say something about that at the very end of the talk. Um, the same physical platform, as it turns out, actually lends itself very well to to quantum simulation. Um, the platform exists of or consists of semiconductor quantum dots. These are, in our case, uh, defined electrostatically with uh, surface gates, you know, created by electron beam lithography with all the flexibility in defining the patterns that lithography allows. And, and using these to apply or to shape a potential landscape in a two-dimensional electron gas, uh, for instance, here shown at the interface of a gallium arsenide and aluminum gallium arsenide heterostructure. And um, in, you know, with this approach, it's actually routine to isolate uh, you know, individual charges in each of these local potential minima, quantum dots as we call them. It's routine to control the hopping, the tunnel coupling between them. Um, we uh, routinely probe how many electrons reside on each, each of these uh, islands. Uh, we have methods in our community to, to probe the spin states or the correlations in the spin states um, of the electrons sitting on these islands. Um, so, you know, it, it's a very versatile, powerful uh, platform. Uh, these are transport measurements, no lasers involved. Uh, it doesn't involve low temperatures, dilution refrigerator temperatures, uh, but these are nowadays, uh, you know, really routine. It's no longer an art to, to cool down a sample. You basically um, purchase a dilution refrigerator and it works and cools down your sample at least uh, most of the time. So now, um, you know, if, if, you, if you look at the history of our community already in the, in the late 1990s, it was realized that a single uh, quantum dot in which electrons are confined in many ways behaves like an artificial atom and people even had fun uh, constructing um, uh, periodic tables uh, of two dimensional instead of three dimensional atoms that we're used to. Uh, also the behavior of uh, bonding and antibonding uh, physics, uh, molecular orbitals uh, was seen. And so these systems have then, then been called artificial atoms and molecules. But the natural question then, that, that is not a new question, it's been around for a long time, is 
can we also construct artificial lattices, uh, such as Fermi Hubbard lattices, and, and study those and learn from those? Um, the the uh, Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian is, of course, naturally emulated by electrons that are allowed to hop in a lattice. Um, in its simplest form, the Fermi Hubbard Hamiltonian has the hopping term, as well as an on site interaction term, which in this case is given by the Coulomb repulsion when two electrons come together on the same ions. Now, what's interesting is that um, there's also long range interaction for electrons sitting on neighboring or next neighbors or next next neighbors, neighboring islands. Um, so this long range interaction, of course, is, is also present in, in real materials that one wishes to study. And it's uh, actually interesting that this is also by nature present in these quantum dot arrays. Um, furthermore, there is a local offset uh, in the potential of each of the sites. This local offset, as well as the hopping, can be tuned with the device called, when the device is called uh, in situ using the uh, gate voltages. Um, the interaction energies, they vary a little bit with the gate voltages, but they are mostly set by design, uh, by you know basically by how much uh, space you give the electrons. Uh, to, to exist, or, or what pitch you got there. So now... Um, let's see, I, the sound quality was not very good. I couldn't understand you very well. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing your thinking or harm? You need an energy range 0.5 million electrons. Why are you doing but so now another consideration in addition to of course the terms that are present is is the range of the or well yeah the range of energy scales that are accessible um and and what's interesting is that in a dilution refrigerator which is well filtered um the the um well the the fridge temperature is you know below 10 millikelvin so let's say about one micro electron volt uh and if you if you filter your your electrons well if you filter your wires well uh your electron temperature Actually, it comes in the same uh, ballpark, and so that allows us um, to go to the most interesting part of the phase diagram, where the thermal energy is much below the hopping, and where the hopping is still well below the onsite interaction energy. And again, the the hopping and the local potentials are are uh, tunable by gate voltages. Let me look at the question in the chat here. Uh, why are you limited to half a million electron volt for the hopping term? A uh, good question. In fact, uh, we're we're not. So we can increase the hopping term further. The difficulty is that at some point, um, well, first what happens is, is it begins to be hard to measure uh, the hopping. So, so we could try to extrapolate uh, and then access larger uh, hoppings. And you know that, that is somewhat reliable, I would say. And then ultimately, uh, at some point, you, you reach the limit where, or the regime where your hopping is comparable to the single particle level spacing on each of the sites. And, and then, um, yeah. Then, then it doesn't make sense anymore. And then it, it basically you get one large, one large dot. The dots are the islands are so well coupled that it becomes one large island. And I'll actually show you data where we transition into that uh, regime. So um, what I'd like to to show you is um, you know give you a, a flavor, give you an idea of of why it took our community um, you know from the early quantum dot experiments in the late 1990s or in the 1990s to the last couple of years to, to really make progress on quantum simulation, analog quantum simulation with quantum dot arrays. Uh, then I'll try to show three specific examples of experiments that we've done probing various regimes. And finally, I'll, um, I hope to have time to, to show you briefly where we are uh, with the realization of um, more and more and better and better controlled uh, quantum bits which is, of course, relevant for uh, digital quantum simulation. So uh, here is just a collection of images all from the gallium arsenide, uh, aluminum gallium arsenide community showing how over the years um, we've extended the number of sites that we could uh, controllably fill. Um, I remember a PhD student in my group, Tim Barth, who graduated maybe four or five years ago. 
he um, postulated a law, which in, in my group has been, become known as Tim's law. And he projected based on his own experience with double, triple and quadruple dots that it would take about uh, the duration of a PhD to tune up an eight dot device. And fortunately that, that didn't um, pan out that prediction. In fact, uh, two years ago, we published a paper showing that in let's say a day, a day and a half, uh, we could tune up a um, eight dot device from scratch. And nowadays uh, with silicon, it looks like it's even easier. Um, a six dot device of, an, of a type, I should say of a type that we've cooled down before within an hour or so, uh, you have an electron in each of the sites. In the meantime, also two-dimensional arrays are coming of age. Here again, you see examples of Gallimarsonite, the most complex from Tristan Meunier in Grenoble with a three by three uh, array. So all of this is uh, really happening on, on the lithography side. Now, the lithography, of course, was under control longer ago. So what, what then really um, made, made the difference or what stood in the way? What stood in the way was disorder and, and crosstalk. Uh, these are, of course, structures in nanoscale devices in a solid, there's lots of um, charged impurities around. Um, and what we have learned as a community is to be able to deal with the disorder and the crosstalk efficiently, uh, such that we can talk, for instance, about virtual gates. These are linear combinations of gate voltages that are designed to uh, change just, just one parameter at a time. And in the beginning, we did this for the local potentials. Now we also do this for the uh, tunnel barriers. Um, and and this, this change of mindset really simplified a lot the description and, and the experiments. Um, furthermore, or, or, or as, an il, as an illustration of this concept, you know, the way that we efficiently fill this eight dot array is to form first one or two dots on one side of the array, oops. And then to, to um, form dots one at a time. And for every dot that we form, we compensate for the crosstalk that the additional or, or you know the additional gates that you now bias, the crosstalk that they have on the dots that you've already formed, so that you keep what you have in place. And you just keep adding, and this is now uh, very efficient. It works very well. And then finally, um, on the experimental techniques, um, we've really made progress in making our acquisition chain much more efficient, um, such that uh, two-dimensional scans that tell us, for instance, how many electrons are in, each, in which of the dots uh, come in, um, you know, basically in real time, sometimes at video rate, um, instead of, you know, launching a measurement, waiting for half an hour or an hour for a single scan to come back and then launching the next uh, scan. So, so all of these um, developments that are happening in our group and elsewhere um, make the proposition of really uh, engineering your Hamiltonian uh, in this Fermi Herbert fashion uh, much more, much more uh, realistic. Um, we've also began to experiment with automating some of this uh, tune-up, and as we progress uh, and, and access more, you know, larger and larger arrays, this becomes uh, an increasingly important part of our of our routine uh, set of tools. So all of this is coming along, and and um, the three results that uh, we've uh, looked at in, or you know, that, that we've obtained in my group. Uh, I would like to, to give some perspective and, and categorize them by the uh, energy scales that really dominate the physics here. The first experiment that goes back a few years um, is what we call, or what actually Shankar introduced as the transition between Coulomb blockade and collective Coulomb blockade, and we'll explain what that is. But I just want to point out here that the relevant energy scale is the onsite interaction energy U. Oh, uh, then there is a typo. I just uh, copied this wrong. The second should be Nagaoka for magnetism. But, uh, I'll explain that as well. Um, and, and that actually is a competition between um, delocalization of holes, which Emmanuel uh, spoke about. Uh, and that's driven by uh, the hopping term T. And it has to compete with the uh, spin exchange interaction. But so the, the, the interaction or the, the, the energy term that favors this Nagaoka ferromagnetic ground state is basically proportional to the hopping T. And then finally, uh, I'll show you work that's uh, on archive now on a Heisenberg spin chain, uh, where of course the relevant energy scale is T squared over U. So this is the hierarchy of energy scales as we go through the energy scales get smaller and smaller. So the um, transition between Coulomb blockade and collective Coulomb blockade was, was predicted 
uh, already, uh, you know, 20, more than 25 years ago by, by Stafford and the Sarma. And um, essentially, it's, the, it's, it's the, the, the transition between having on the one hand charges that are, that are localized on individual sites versus charges that are localized in the collective system. Uh, if you have a very large collective system, it becomes a metal. If you have still a finite size collective system, you know you still have you can still have uh, charging effects. But at least this is the the transition, and we map this out in quite some detail in this um, linear array of three quantum dots, where you have here the three quantum dots uh, side by side, um, controlled with the gate voltages. You know the, we, we control independently the onsite in, sorry the onsite the local offsets and and the hopping energies. And then next to these three quantum dots in a row, you see an additional quantum dot, and we will actually measure the current through this additional quantum dot. And that current, it turns out, is very sensitive to how many electrons exist on each of these sites and also to where on these sites the electrons exist. Uh, so basically it's a it's an electrometer uh, telling us uh, yeah, what the charge distribution is. Um, the, the data here in color scale is then the differential conductance through this uh, charge sensing dot. And whenever there is a single charge added to the system or removed from the system, it will show up as a, as a peak, uh, which is now here the dark blue lines in this two dimensional color plot. On the horizontal axis, we homogeneously, compensating for all the crosstalk, we homogeneously lower the potential on the three sides allowing more and more particles to be drawn in. On the vertical axis, we homogeneously crank up the interdot telecouplings between sites one and two and between sites two and three, respectively, or well, homogeneously. And so let, let's just walk through this diagram and look at the physics that happens. Uh, at the bottom left, we're, uh, we start off with an empty system. And at some point, we see the first dark blue line indicating that the first electron is uh, pulled in. Um, then actually we see the effect not of the on-site interaction, but of the long-range interaction. That is to say, pulling an electron in on a neighboring site costs additional energy. And that's why the next blue line is, is displaced a little bit here. And the, and the one after that is again displaced. So these are signs, or the, the fact that these three don't coincide are the result of the long-range interaction. But then you have a large gap before you can pull in the fourth electron. And of course, the fourth electron now means double occupancy of at least one of the sites. And, and, and now you have to overcome the local interaction and GU, which is much larger than the long range interaction energy. So that's why you get this comparatively large gap. Then you get another set of three followed by a large gap. And the same story repeats. And we pull in, pull in, in this experiment up to 12 electrons in total. So now starting from this situation at the bottom, and I didn't mention it explicitly, but, but this is the case where the hopping energy is very low. We now crank up the hopping. And what you see is that, um, you know, it's just like in a, in a hydrogen uh, molecule, you get bond bonding and antibonding states. Now you get a, a equivalent physics for the three sides. You could call it a mini or a, or a micro band. It's the same type of physics, right? Uh, so because of the hopping, now the levels begin to, to repel each other. Um, and uh, you end up here uh, at large hopping in the situation where the hopping is so large that, that for all practical purposes, it's hard to distinguish the, the entire system from a single large dot. Uh, so now you've, you're, in, you're in, the, in the regime of collective uh, Coulomb blockade, whereas at the bottom here, you started in uh, the conventional Coulomb blockade uh, where every particle was forced to stay on its own site. Um, you know, if you, if you stretch it, if you imagine that this is the precursor to a much larger system, this is the equivalent of the melt insulator to metal uh, transition. Um, I want to point out that in addition to doing this experiment, we worked together with Shankar and his postdoc to, um, uh, let's see, to um, assess our understanding of this system by providing independently calibrated parameters for the hopping, the long range, and the on-site interactions. And then um, uh, Shaoli, the postdoc, put these numbers into a numerical model and um, then predicted where, you know, at which combination of hopping and on-site interaction electrons would be pulled into the system. And the, these are calculated uh, 
and plotted as the red circles. And so the close agreement between the position of the red circles and the experimentally measured uh, addition spectra, as we call them, tells us that, that we have a pretty good uh, self-consistent understanding of, of our system here. So this is all in the, in the oh, and, right, and, and let me point out, you know, for this particular experiment, um, the ratio of U over T is up to something like seven and ratio of hopping over temperature, thermal energy, uh, up to something like, uh, like 50. So, so this is all in the charge sector. So how about um, uh, spin states and magnetism? And here we looked at a form of magnetism predicted already in 1966 by Nagaoka. And um, uh, Emmanuel already alluded to it. It occurs when you have a spin lattice, a spin one half lattice, you go to half filling. And Nagaoka's prediction was that in the limit where you remove just a single electron or a single spin from your, uh, from your lattice, um, that the, um, all the remaining electrons, all the remaining fermions, would become spin polarized spontaneously. And this would occur driven by interactions. Um, and, um, and, and it's really because the um, remaining hole from removing the electron uh, can lower its energy more efficiently, of course, the more it can delocalize. And it can delocalize more efficiently when all of the electron spin states uh, are aligned with each other. You can basically, um, yeah, um, basically the different paths that the, that the hole can take through the path, through the, through the lattice, um, um, they um, interfere constructively when all the electron spins are aligned. And, and that's not the case if the electron spins are basically in random configurations. So now what uh, Eugene Demler pointed out to me more than 10 years ago when I was on an extended visit to the Center for Ultra Cold Atoms is that the smallest instance in which you could probe this physics is actually a simple two by two plaquette with three electrons, three fermions. And uh, together with uh, Bernard Tunch and, and Mark Rudner, we actually uh, estimated uh, the, you know, the energy scales and, and assessed the feasibility of this experiment and uh, found that, you know, in principle, this experiment should be uh, feasible with quantum dots. Um, and so we set out to, to try this experiment. Here you see a scanning electron micrograph of the two by two quantum dot lattice with two, oops, two additional charge sensors. Um, we calibrate the hopping for all of the uh, telecouplings along the perimeter of this uh, plaquette. We go to the regime where there is one electron on each side, remove one, so three electrons in total. And we work very hard, at least initially, to line up the potential of these four sites so that the hole can easily uh, delocalize. Um, in this case, U over T was uh, 125 and hopping over thermal energy, something like three, just to put things a little bit in perspective for those thinking about these energy scales or these hierarchy of energy scales. Um, the experimental procedure for, for probing and, and preparing the system is as follows. So, so rather than uh, trying to create a condition where this so-called, well, let's call it the Nagaoka gap, is larger than the thermal energy. What we do is we start from a uh, configuration where there's a very large uh, energy gap and then adiabatically transition to the condition where this Nagaoka ground state um, uh, should occur. And depending on uh, whether we transition diabatically or adiabatically, we'll reach the um, uh, ground state or we will uh, remain in the unpolarized initial state. So, so specifically the initial state is one where we on purpose lower the potential on one of the sides, on site one. And actually we lowered it enough that two particles, two particles, two electrons can sit there together, but only if they are in a spin singlet configuration. So that is a well-defined low entropy initial state for these two spins. And then the third spin sits on dot four uh, and it's essentially in a random configuration. And so from there, we then move um, along a straight line in this virtual gate space to the condition where the four, where the potential of the four sides is lined up as good as we can. And that means that the hole now can uh, move around the plaquette. 
um, the energy landscape along, uh, you know, between this state preparation point and uh, this Megaoka point, as we then call it, point N, um, where the Megaoka conditions should be satisfied. The energy landscape looks as, looks as follows here on the right. Um, there's a large gap here where we prepare singlet and then the unpaired spin. And then as we come closer to um, point N, uh, all the states come close together. And then at some point, you see the crossover that the low spin state that we prepared in is no longer the ground state. And actually the ground state is predicted to be uh, the fully uh, polarized state. Um, to probe the system, what we're going to do is then from, from, from this condition, pulse back rapidly to point M, meaning that we take out two of the three electrons and we will then project it into the single triplet basis. Um, if we had here a spin polarized state, the probability for finding a triplet should be large. If we take out three electrons, you know, uh, if, the, if, if we take out two of the three electrons and if they have the same spin state, uh, ideally it should be 100% projection onto the triplet. Uh, of course, if we um, uh, are in the unpolarized state, uh, the triplet fraction that we detect should be much smaller. So that's the basic idea. And um, here you see uh, typical measurements. And um, um, what, what you see is that if we start uh, from the left and then we pulse to the right, uh, stop somewhere here and then come back, we just have a low singlet fraction. Um, as we reach point N, um, then the triplet fraction, uh, you know, significantly steps up. And so that's what we were expecting. Um, and now if you look closely, uh, the, the following happens. And, and, and now it's also important to, again, distinguish whether we uh, initialize here uh, diabatically or adiabatically. If we initialize slowly, we end up, because this crossing is actually an avoided crossing because of hyperfine and spin orbit mixing, we actually end up in the polarized state or we should. Uh, so that's the red line here. And indeed that's where you get uh, overall a large triplet fraction. On the other hand, if we pulse in rapidly, we go through these anti-crossings and we end up, or we, you know, we, we basically stay in the unpolarized state. So you get here a low uh, triplet fraction. Note that if we pulse in rapidly, there are still these wings where the um, triplet fraction is locally uh, enhanced. And that's understood by the fact that when we pulse rapidly and end up near these avoided crossings, we um, get mixing between the singlet and the triplet uh, states because of hyperfine and spin orbit coupling. And, and that's why you get now still, uh, yeah, where you still pick up an enhanced triplet fraction. Um, okay. so. Looking at, at this data, this is uh, something that you can understand, something that you can explain. Uh, but of course, in the spirit of quantum simulation, we would like to test this further. We would like to learn from it further. And so we do a few tests now. The first is to change effectively the topology of the system. So we started here um, by working hard to get all these tunnel couplings in the, let's say, 15 to 19 micro electron volt range. Um, but because the tunnel couplings are controlled by gate voltages, what we can do is to raise one of these tunnel barriers, make it very high and effectively uh, make it so high that the hopping along the bottom um, um, connection here is, is completely um, suppressed. And what that does is to effectively change the topology from a closed plaquette from periodic boundary conditions to open boundary conditions. Um, and now the ground state is no longer predicted to be the ferromagnetic ground state, but rather the unpolarized uh, spin state, the lowest spin state that's available, consistent with the leap mattis theorem for uh, systems with open, well, linear, linear systems with open boundary conditions. Uh, so that's the prediction. And, and then we do the experiment. And indeed, we see that this difference, this kind of telltale characteristic difference between pulsing and rapidly and slowly um, disappears as we change here. Uh, the, topo the topology of our system, uh, like we would expect. Um, the next prediction is actually quite intriguing. Um, it is that if you apply a even a very weak magnetic field perpendicular to the plaquette, 
that the uh, ferromagnetic ground state actually should be destroyed. So that's a bit counterintuitive. We're used to magnets that get magnetized by application of an external magnetic field. Here, applying an external magnetic field actually can kill the ferromagnetic ground state. And the intuition is that, you know, remember I explained that, that the hole can delocalize around the ring by interfering constructively with itself going around clockwise or anticlockwise, and that this is most efficient when the electron spins are, are aligned. But now if you have a weak magnetic field perpendicular to the plaquette, of course, the, the hole picks up an ion or a bone phase as it travels around the ring. And, and what was constructive interference should become destructive interference. Now I should say in the experiment, it's, it, it was hard to, to do the experiment in as clean a way as we would have liked. And that's because uh, the magnetic field also, also introduces a Zeeman splitting. And the result is that the lines, the, the, the energy levels here that were close together now actually begin to overlap. Um, but nevertheless, you know, we did the test and, and what we saw uh, is, is as we expected that very quickly with the magnetic field, um, you, you basically uh, lose this, this, this contrast between um, polarized and, and yeah, pulsing it rapidly and quickly. Then there's a final test, and this one actually really uh, surprised us uh, the most. Here, you know, remember that in the beginning, we worked hard to, to align as good as we could the potential, the local potential on each of the four sides, allowing the hole to move around and delocalize low edge energy by delocalization. Now what we did was to offset on purpose with the gate voltage, the potential on just one of the sides. We would offset it either to, you know, to higher energy or to lower energy. Uh, by amounts in this case of plus or minus 50 micro electron volt, which is several times larger than the hopping energy. Um, we definitely expected that um, such large offsets would make it much harder for the hole to lower its energy by moving around the ring. And we were expecting the characteristic difference between um, you know, this, this kind of maximum triplet fraction versus a suppression and triplet fraction with the wings, but this characteristic, characteristic difference would be completely uh, washed out. But that's not what we saw actually um, for, you know, regardless of which uh, potential, the potential for which dot we offset, um, these, these signatures uh, survived. In the beginning, this actually worried us because we thought that, you know, maybe we're not seeing the right physics. Uh, maybe it's not like okay, for a magnetism that we were probing, it's something else and we have to understand what it is. But then, and this is of course possible because it's still a, a comparatively small system. Then we numerically simulated um, what the energy level spectrum should look like for each of these four uh, uh, cases. And, and specifically, you know, um, coming in from the point M where we initialized to the point N, um, what it, what we found is that that the observations were actually fully consistent with the numerical uh, simulations. Um, even the the distance between the these uh, small crossings here uh, comes closer together here. If we move the potential upwards for the yellow case, it's a lot farther apart for the green case. Uh, here it's the other way around. Green is closer together than yellow. So if you look closely, it's, it's actually remarkable the quantitative agreement uh, between what we should have been expecting, there was just our intuition that was wrong and, and, and what we were measuring. So, so this is an aspect that I liked. It's you know, basically uh, by doing the experiment that we started to think harder and learn more about the system, um, uh, which I think is the spirit of, of analog quantum simulation. So again, in this case, the, the, um, the spin exchange was actually competing with the hopping, which tried to, uh, you know, which favored the ferromagnetic ground state. In the next experiment, we um, want to look at a Heisenberg spin chain, well understood system. Uh, in this case, four spins in a linear array, where the uh, relevant uh, physics is dominated really by the uh, Heisenberg exchange interaction. The challenges for this experiment were to dial in the individual J's. We actually know from the literature and from our own work how to do this, but in this work we, we uh, came up with, with yeah, yeah, different ways for doing this. Um, then you know um, we had to, to come up with methods here to probe the, or at least we wanted to probe the energy level spectrum 
uh, uh, spin correlations in this many body ground state. And, and finally, um, try to prepare the ground state of the Heisenberg exchange uh, Hamiltonian. The methods that we developed are actually conceptually quite similar to well understood physics. Levin, uh, may I ask you a question? Yes, please, uh, sir. It's the same question uh, I asked Emmanuel. How, I mean, you don't have spin. There are no free spins in solid state systems. You have electrons. So, how do you know that the Heisenberg model applies? I mean, that seems to me to be an assumption. What is the assumption based on? You have four dots, and the dots are electrons, right? Yeah. Electrons have spins, of course, but that doesn't mean Heisenberg model applies. So I'm just asking. Well, I think the, the first evidence is, is uh, this 15-year-old experiment from uh, Jason Pitta when he was in the Marcus group. Um, you know, were, were, and, and, and many experiments since then. So I think there's lots of experimental evidence that all uh, is understood in this Heisenberg spin exchange picture. Of course, uh, there's no such thing like proving um, that, that a certain Hamiltonian applies, but at least everything that we see is consistent with it. So we get more and more uh, convinced that, that this uh, describes our system well. Uh, okay, no, that, that I fully accept, but do you have any, what I'm asking actually is more specific quantitative question. Do you put any constraint on the values of U and T? Of course, there'll be an exchange because you have two quantum dots nearby, you have one electron on each. There is an exchange energy, I completely agree. But is there any constraint on T and U for the experiment you're gonna talk about now with the four dots? That really is my question. Okay, um, well, yes. So, so in this experiment, um, the, the cost, well, so U is, is set basically, and T we made large enough um, such that uh, we obtained J's that are all, that are, okay. um, that are basically okay. larger than, than the uh, hyperfine interaction, for instance, so that it's not uh, background terms that dominate, but that right. the dominant physics is really given by the J's. Right, that basically. was my worry that, that you yeah. and, a bit too small. Well, and it's, and it's, a, and it's, I mean, there's, there, it's a justified worry in the sense it, it hasn't been trivial in our community to come to the point where we can make in our devices all these J's are sufficiently large. But as I was explaining earlier on, you know, with our with, with the recent methods, yes, this is the parameter regime that we can reach. So what is the typical value of J you think you have? I mean, uh, you know, you have the best control, I know that. So what is the typical value of J? Yeah, so, so here it's up to several micro electron volts. Okay, all right. So let's say one to 10 micro electron. All right, thank you. Yeah, that's the ballpark here in, in this particular experiment. Yeah. So yeah, so you know, in probing um, this four spin system, we're going to use concepts that uh, are inspired or, or that can be understood uh, by looking at the double dot uh, physics. So in the double dot system, um, a very common way of uh, going about it is to um, first tilt the potential so that like in the Nagoka experiment, two electrons come together on the same side. Uh, they will be prepared in a spin singlet state. And then we will, um, you know, we will change our potentials or our, our gate voltages so that the spins um, uh, can well become become uh, distribute themselves over the two sides, and then um, so that's that's a way of initializing, and then ways of probing is for instance starting uh, out here and then pulsing the detuning, and if you pulse the detuning just a little bit, you start on the singlet branch, you stay on the singlet branch, nothing much happens if you start out here and you pulse across to here. You start and end uh, on the singlet branch, nothing much happens. But if you pulse, uh, where's my mouse? If you pulse and you end your pulse precisely at the point where your singlet branch that you started on intersects with, um, in this case, the T plus state, then um, because of the hyperfine and spin orbit uh, interaction, these two states again will begin to mix meaning you pick up some triplet probability. And if you then move back to large detuning, you will find that only sometimes uh, do you come back to the state where you know, the two electrons are still in a singlet and they can come together on the same side. And sometimes you're stuck in a triplet. Uh, the two electrons when they're in a triplet cannot come together on the same side because of the Pauli exclusion principle. Um, and, and, and then you probe that in your charge, in, in your electrometer, whether the charges are still each on their own side or, or whether they were able to come together on the right uh, side. And so that's what you see then on the, on the, in, this, in this measurement on the right. Um, 
It's a so-called spin funnel. Um, basically, um, what you do is you vary the magnetic field, and as you vary the magnetic field, you probe for which detuning the T plus here intersects with the singlet branch, and then you get this this uh, um, spectroscopic information, which uh, from where from which we can derive, for instance, the uh, spin exchange coupling J, the singlet uh, to T zero energy difference, uh, and, and so forth. So similar concepts we're going to use now um, for the quadruple dots. The initialization is going to happen by uh, initializing pairwise in a singlet. Then we activate all of the exchanges, including the middle one. Um, we end up in a certain configuration, uh, you know, depending on, on the J's that we dial in. And then we would like to probe the system. And in this case, we're going to probe the system by projecting or trying to project onto the singlet triplet basis for the left two electrons and for the right two electrons. That's the intent. And so that's actually not, not completely trivial for us. Emmanuel mentioned that the energy scales for them are, let's say, a kilohertz. Here it's you know several micro electron volts. And, and then to rapidly switch off these couplings, uh, you have to, to really uh, be careful. Uh, but but we can do is can do this, and you see here on the right, um, single shot or well basically um, yeah accounts of our charge detector signal um, where there are four possible outcomes you know the the charge detector uh, signal probing uh, singlet singlet uh, triplet singlet triplet triplet or or uh, the singlet triplet signal um, and so we then perform measurements where we vary the conditions at which we sit in this state here starting from the preparation we pulse to this state here um, and and on the left what we vary here are the uh, exchange between the left two spins and the exchange between the right two spins that's the vertical and the horizontal axes the intermediate exchange in this left panel is on purpose kept relatively small and it's fixed and then we also have a magnetic field in this case for the millitesla so what we see in these uh, spectroscopic data uh, where, where you see in the color scale the probabilities plotted for the singlet singlet triplet singlet and so on probabilities uh, let's let's just um, go through a couple of these so out here we get a line where there is an increased singlet triplet probability uh, that's where we um, pulse well again we start from singlet singlet and then we pulse to the condition where the singlet singlet becomes degenerate with the singlet left and the t plus on the right so that's this line over here. Similarly, the vertical line where you get a large triplet singlet probability in your measurement statistics is where you've got a T plus on the left and then a singlet on the right. We can identify other states where um, there is an increased triplet triplet uh, fraction in the measurement. And then actually all of these features or most yeah, all of these features pretty much, they also come back in the singlet singlet probability but then as the negative because all the you know you started in singlet singlet and all the probabilities that have moved elsewhere are removed uh, here so it's kind of you know, the, the, the inverse signal um, at the condition where um, this and that line uh, meet each other that's where the um, uh, let's see uh, uh, there's something with the animations. Okay, in the case that, that's where, oh yeah, that's where the um, left exchange, spin exchange, and the right spin exchange are equal to each other. And because of how they're probed, at this point, that's also where both of the exchanges correspond to a Zeman splitting of 40 millitesla. And you can see here the energy scales. Uh, so on, on the right now, we move to this point and then are going to vary the magnetic field and the middle spin exchange, keeping the outer exchanges uh, fixed. And, and so um, if you then again do the spectroscopy, you see the various features. In this case, we could identify these three lines with crossings of the, uh, of the global singlet with the global triplets. And when the spacing between these lines is equal to each other, that's the condition actually where all the J's are equal to each other. So that's something that for this small scale experiment, we could still uh, yeah, compare against the numerical simulation. 
if we so, so this, actually, this actually provides now, uh, as I announced, a way of identifying the condition where all of the J's are equal to each other. And we then um, probed whether we could really project properly uh, into you know, single triplet measurements on the left and on the right, or project onto single triplet in the middle, uh, meaning that we needed to diabetically switch off the couplings that, that, uh, you know, that are switched off here. Uh, and, and allowing us then to probe at these the, 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 the spin correlations. And so, oh, this is, uh, yeah, the, the one sits a bit in the way of the other, sorry for that. Um, but basically what I've done here is to write down the um, antiferromagnetic or the ground state of, of the antiferromagnetic Heisenberg spin uh, Hamiltonian in two ways. At the top, uh, it's expanded in the basis of the left pair, right pair, single triplets. And then the, at the bottom, it's expanded in the, in the basis of the middle versus outer pair. And uh, what you see is that um, expanded in this first basis, um, the probability of obtaining a singlet singlet outcome is predicted to be 93%. And that is actually, you know, the dashed line is the, the, the condition where all the J's are equal from the prior calibration. And that is actually very close to what we um, observe in the experiment. If you project onto the middle outer pair basis, then for the middle pair, the probability of finding a singlet should be 50%, basically. And again, at the dashed line, where um, we, we predict the condition to be of, of reaching this, uh, the condition with J's, well, the homogeneous Heisenberg chain, um, we, we, um, we measure 50%. I should say, in order to, to get these numbers, we did have to correct for relaxation that takes place during the measurement. So we uh, took that out of the measurement statistics, but that relaxation time scale, we can independently measure and, and yeah, it's not it's not a fitting parameter, it's just calibrated and taken out. And then finally, this, this entire spin system does evolve coherently. Um, this is shown here in these time domain as, uh, measurements where we rapidly pulse uh, on the right here, again, from the singlet, singlet condition to a situation where all the exchanges are turned on. And then um, we see here um, uh, coherent oscillations. You see here the fast, uh, the, the Fourier transform, coherent oscillations within the singlet subspace. We can also prepare the left pair, not in the singlet state, but in the T plus. And starting from the T plus singlet initial condition, and then rapidly pulsing to a condition where all the Js are on, uh, we kickstart the time evolution in the uh, uh, global triplet uh, subspace. So, so this is different from what you see typically in the quantum dot literature, which are uh, coherent oscillations where one spin exchange is activated at the time. So here they're all on at the same time, and it's a coherent evolution under this global uh, spin exchange Hamiltonian. All right, so I'm almost out of time. Um, we are very keen to continue this line of research of analog quantum simulation. We're currently um, um, studying ladder systems. Um, and, and I think you know, it's a very versatile, powerful platform. The lithography allows uh, also uh, triangular ladders, for instance. Um, and you know, we can control the filling, we can control the hopping, we can probe spin correlations, charges. It, it's, it's very, uh, I think it's a very nice system to work with. So, so just in brief, you know, how are we progressing towards digital quantum simulation? All the experiments that I've shown until now were taken on gallium arsenide samples, where spin coherence is severely limited by the hyperfine interaction with the uh, spin-full nuclei that are only spin-full nuclei in gallium arsenide. Oops. In contrast, in silicon, um, only 5% of the nuclei has a, has a nuclear spin, and it's even possible, possible to use isotopically enriched uh, substrates where um, there are almost no nuclear spins. And so this has allowed the T2 star to be extended by 100 moving to silicon and another factor of 100, so 10,000 moving to, pur to purified silicon. So, so that's a very good starting point for uh, programming quantum bits. It's also a very good starting point, I should say, for uh, continued studies of uh, analog quantum simulation. And also those measurements are going to move to, to uh, group four um, uh, substrates. Um, but just to show some of the recent progress uh, from the field, you see beautiful single qubit oscillations on the top left 
from the Terucha group, fidelities are well over three ninths. Um, in our group, we have unpublished work where for the first time uh, in our community, two qubit gate fidelity is well over 99% uh, were achieved. Earlier, earlier reports were 92 and 98% uh, two qubit gate fidelities, but that's now also well over 99%. Um, and, and we're not yet at uh, hitting the limits, uh, at least not as far as we can tell from our experiments. Um, in the meantime, also, um, uh, the number of qubits is steadily increasing. Here you see measurements on a linear array of six quantum dots in a row, where you see beautiful chevron patterns driving one spin at a time. The six resonance frequencies are separated from each other, and, and then also um, activating each of the spin exchange uh, interactions between neighboring spins uh, one at a time. You get beautiful spin exchange oscillations. Um, with this system, we have sufficient control that we can really you know, program and implement quantum circuits. Um, and and uh, for instance, um, in this circuit, we um, entangle spin or qubit two with qubit uh, five uh, by successive controlled rotations or, and then uh, by you know, adding two more controlled rotations, you can disentangle the intermediate spins from the, from the, uh, yeah, from the cat state and, and um, you've entangled two and, and, and five. And so that's the type of circuits that we're now programming, programming that we're playing with. It's not yet perfect. We're working on improving calibration routines, um, uh, but it's, it's really, yeah, coming of age, I would say. And then uh, let me close with this last unpublished work uh, where we have built on earlier work from ourselves, the PETA group, ETH, other places, um, um, studying the, well, basically studying cavity QED, where the cavity is a superconducting resonator, similar to used to those used in the superconducting qubit community, um, uh, and where a single electron spin uh, achieves the strong coupling regime uh, to the microwave photon in the resonator, and where we have now, and this is, uh, you know, I would say, a recent advance, uh, also observed the direct spin spin interaction. You see here the Zeeman splitting of one, uh, well, on, on one in one double dot being manipulated. Here the Zeeman splitting in the other double dot. If you activate both of them together, instead of having two lines that cross, you see the clear level of repulsion uh, indicating a coherent interaction between two electron spins at a distance of a few hundred microns, mediated by uh, by virtual occupation of the of um, yeah virtual microwave photons in in the resonator. So yeah, let me end here with, with the summary. Uh, on the analog front, we've moved from uh, effects related to charging energies to hopping energies to giving magnetic phases to uh, spin exchange interactions, um, um, allowing us to prepare the Heisenberg spin chain. Um, the, the, the spin qubits um, uh, work is, is really progressing. Um, and um, I expect that also very soon we'll be in a position to, to program some uh, digital quantum simulation algorithms on, on these systems. Most importantly, let me uh, thank the group. This is a picture from last summer, Corona Proof, as you can see, um, and, and the many other people from my group and other groups that we collaborate with that have uh, contributed to this work. So thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Levin, for this uh, great talk. And uh, I think we still have like a couple of minutes for a few questions. I had a uh, question. Um, this is uh, Robert Throckmorton. Um, so in, in your um, results for um, the uh, two qubit uh, gates, like when you were saying that you had 99.5% uh, fidelity, um, how many qubits did you have total in your uh, system? Yeah, so in that, in that particular experiment, it was a two qubit device. Okay. And so the next logical uh, goal that, that we're working on is to show that we can get such high fidelities across arrays like this six dot array. But, but the first demonstration was in a double dot. Okay, all right, thanks. Okay, uh, any other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, you know, there has been steady progress but let's take one of your uh, quantum simulation experiment, let's say the Fermi-Hubbard simulation or the Nagaoka simulation. Uh, with the current technology that you have in your lab, 
do you see being able to do those experiments with eight or 10 dots in the near future? Now, remember, I'm much older than you, so my near future is shorter than your near future. It, uh, the answer is yes. Um, what, within two years? Oh, uh, hopefully in the course of this year. So we have currently a four by two ladder that, that we're testing. And uh, hopefully in the course of this year, we'll, we'll be able to uh, do some relevant physics experiments on that. So you have an eight qubit system that's already, you are trying to see some of this, this strong correlation physics. It's already an eight qubit system, four by two. Yeah. I see. yeah, I mean, well, so in the, in the spirit of analog quantum simulation, I would call it an eight side system. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, but yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's my question. So you are already trying an eight side system. Okay, yeah, that's yeah, very encouraging. Yes, yeah, yes. That's very encouraging. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And after eight, we won't do 10. We will double it or I don't know. Yeah, we, we, yeah I, th I think these are the steps that we can take. Yes. I see. So your control has improved quite a bit even in the last two years. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it has. Okay, maybe one last uh, quick question. Uh, if not, let's uh, thank Levin again for this wonderful talk. And uh, I think we are, move on. we are ready to move on to the next talk. Thank you. So Andrew, maybe you can start uh, sharing a screen to see if it works. Okay. How's that? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, it's great. Excellent. Okay, so I think we are right on time. And uh, so our next speaker is, uh, is Dr. Uh, Andrew Charles from uh, the Computer Science Department uh, at UMD uh, in Maryland. And uh, Dr. Charles is, uh, is also the co-director of QUIX, and that is basically the Joint Center of Quantum Information and Computer Science. And uh, he's generally interested in the theory of quantum information processing, especially the quantum algorithm. And today he will talk about this efficient quantum algorithm for dissipative uh, nonlinear differential equations. And uh, uh, the, the floor is yours. Okay, yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to, to speak here in this meeting. And uh, so today I'd like to tell you about some work on uh, algorithms for digital quantum computers. Uh, you know, this work relates uh, a bit to quantum simulation, which I guess, you know, we're hearing a lot about today, but um, uh, it's it's a, for a slightly different task. And, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully you'll find it interesting. So um, this is joint work with several of my co-authors, uh, Jinpeng, Herman, Nuno, Hari, and Constantina. And if you want to read more about this work, you can find a preprint on the archive that goes into much more detail than I'll be able to, to talk about here. OK, so um, just to set the, the stage a little bit, uh, this is you know, uh, probably very familiar, but you know, this is a talk about, uh, as I said, what you can do with digital quantum computers. And you know, as, you, as you probably know, uh, you know, we think that there are problems that we can solve a lot faster with quantum computers than we can with ordinary classical computers. And so there's you know, a, quite a, a lot of work in this area of understanding what we can do with quantum algorithms. Um, you know, there are many problems for which, or maybe I shouldn't say many, but there are problems for which uh, we think we can get an exponential speed up over the best classical strategies. You know, these include things like uh, cryptanalytic kinds of problems like factoring, uh, simulating quantum mechanics, and also some other things. Um, you know, there's also a, a, an even broader class of problems for which, uh, you know, we don't know how to get exponential speed up. And maybe in some cases, we, we know we can't get exponential speed up, uh, but for which we can get some significant speed up like polynomial speed up over the best uh, over the best classical algorithms. And uh, as I said, I mean, there's a much broader class of problems for which we can do this. And many of these problems have to do with sort of, you know, uh, problems on graphs, combinatorial search, uh, you know, really a quite a wide variety of problems. But so recently there's been, um, you know, I would say uh, another class of problems that people have studied um, you know, as, as potential targets for, for quantum computers, you know, in addition to, to some of the many problems that are listed up here, uh, which have to do with problems in numerical analysis. So the idea is somehow to do high dimensional linear algebra on a quantum computer. And, uh, you know, for these problems, for many of these problems, we really hope to get, um, in some sense, an, expon an exponential speed up over the kinds of things that we can do classically. Although, as you'll see, and as I will try to emphasize throughout the talk, um, there are some, you know, caveats about the, the sort of way in which we can solve these problems when we think about this idea of sort of doing linear algebra in Hilbert space um, that make it not exactly comparable to the kinds of things we can do classically, not, not sort of directly comparable, but uh, nevertheless potentially interesting. Um, so the sort of idea of this general class of algorithms is that we have some vector we would like to represent, um, and we're going to represent it by a quantum state. 
So, so we've got some vector in some large, you know, n-dimensional complex vector space, and we're going to represent it through a normalized quantum state, um, which is, you know, proportional, proportional to that vector x. And of course, an advantage of doing this is that, you know, if x is an n-dimensional vector, well, whereas, you know, if you wanted to write that down, like, you know, in MATLAB, you would need to write down, you know, n numbers for the n components of that vector, you know, quantum mechanically, you only need log n qubits. Um, and so, you know, you can represent such a, such a vector in, in a sense very succinctly, although it's a very different kind of representation. Um, and in some cases, you can actually show how to prepare such a state very efficiently. You can actually prepare it in time uh, that's polynomial in the number of qubits that it takes to represent the vector, polynomial in the log of the dimension. Um, so that's a lot better in some sense than, than what you could hope to do classically if you were somehow, you know, uh, manipulating the vector directly, uh, you know, let's say in MATLAB. Um, but it's, as I was saying, you know, not directly comparable. It's a sort of quantum encoding of the solution, which is not at all the same thing as having an explicit representation. So it's less informative, you know, it doesn't tell you exactly what the entire vector is. But on the other hand, you know, it's much more succinct, you can do it much faster in, in many cases, and still potentially, you know, having such a quantum representation could be useful uh, for some tasks. So that's the kind of general picture that we want to we want to look at. Okay, so quantum simulation, we can think of actually as, as a kind of task uh, in this sense. So I guess we're hearing a lot about quantum simulation, uh, so maybe it needs no introduction for the purpose of this, uh, you know, meeting today. This is, uh, you know, one of the main potential applications of quantum computers and actually was one of the, one of the reasons that they were proposed in the first place. Um, so, you know, we could mean many different things by quantum simulation. Uh, what I mean for the purpose of this talk is, you know, simulating Hamiltonian dynamics on a digital quantum computer. And I really mean like a universal fault tolerant device. So we're not talking about sort of, you know, NISC era uh, quantum computation in this, in this uh, talk. I really have in mind that you have like a universal, uh, you know, fault tolerant quantum computer. So in this quantum simulation problem, we have some description of the Hamiltonian that we would like to simulate. We have some time we'd like to evolve for. We're given a copy of the initial state and we want to produce the final state in the memory of our quantum computer. And we want to do that approximately, let's say to within some error epsilon. Okay, so this task is really somehow an inherently quantum mechanical task, right? Because I said the input is given as a quantum state and the output is provided as a quantum state, right? So this is really like what I was saying before that somehow, you know, the, the solution is represented by a quantum state. I mean, of course, here it's extremely natural because the thing you're trying to understand is a quantum state, right? So our goal is just to produce a copy of the quantum state. But, you know, again, that's not the same thing as producing an explicit description of the vector. Um, and, you know, so a quantum computer produces this copy of the quantum state if it's able to run a quantum simulation. Um, and, you know, that's not the same thing as, as having a full description, but, you know, with such a representation of the quantum system, you can answer questions that seem to be hard for, for classical computers. Uh, I mean, of course, you can answer exactly the same kinds of questions that you could if you had an experiment, right? You could measure sort of observables on the state. Uh, you can measure energies or, you know, correlation functions or other kinds of things you might want to know about the quantum state. Um, and by measuring such things, you can do things that we think are hard for classical computers, right? In particular, this problem of simulating Hamiltonian dynamics is what we call in the sort of complexity theory jargon, a BQP complete problem. So that means that anything that a quantum computer could do efficiently, actually, you could encode into such a Hamiltonian simulation. So the ability to do this thing with a, with a quantum device actually you know, um, encodes the full power of, of quantum computation, factoring and quantum simulation and, you know, all the applications that I, that I mentioned before. It somehow, it, you know, has all the power of quantum computing in it. Okay, so there are, you know, there are various things you might try to use quantum simulation for. The sort of most obvious kinds of things are to do, you know, computational physics, right? You, you simulate quantum systems because you want to understand the behavior of quantum systems. But there's sort of another reason to think about simulating Hamiltonian dynamics, which is to use those Hamiltonian dynamics to implement other quantum algorithms. So, you know, maybe you, you know about adiabatic optimization, which is a way of trying to minimize, you know, cost functions, solve general kinds of, you know, minimization problems um, by adiabatic Hamiltonian dynamics. Um, there are various kinds of algorithms having to do with what are called quantum walks on graphs that sometimes achieve speed up over, over classical algorithms. And what I'm going to talk about is sort of, you know, what's, what's depicted over here on the right, sort of this class of algorithms that work um, by sort of doing linear algebra in, in Hilbert space. And so these are algorithms that somehow the core, uh, you know, uh, capability that they're taking advantage of is Hamiltonian simulation, but they're using it to produce these representations of vectors as quantum states. 
Um, and these are quantum states that are not representing like the state of some you know realistic physical quantum system, but they're just uh, representing vectors um, you know that represent sort of linear algebraic objects, you know solutions of systems of uh, linear equations or differential equations or things like this. Um, we want to sort of you know try to use quantum simulation as a tool to produce these things, even though we're not necessarily talking about simulating quantum mechanical dynamics, you know, of some physical quantum system. Okay, so, um, you know, the kind of uh, workhorse of these algorithms is this thing called the quantum linear systems algorithm that was developed by Harrow, Hasidim, and Lloyd uh, now, you know, more than 10 years ago, which, uh, you know, addresses this basic problem of understanding the solution of a system of linear equations. So in this problem, let's imagine we have a square system of linear equations. We have n equations and n unknowns. Um, and then you know, they're captured by this system, ax equals b. So a is an n by n matrix, b is an n component vector. And we want to find the solution of this. Um, and so let's imagine that there is a uh, you know, solution of this system of equations. So if this matrix a is invertible, then we can write the solution as you know, x equals a inverse times b. And so our goal is to understand, you know, we're given some kind of a description of a and b, and our goal is to understand the solution at x. Okay, so you know, if we want to do this um, with a classical computer or with a quantum computer, if the goal is to explicitly write down the vector x, then obviously we need linear time to do that. I mean, we need linear time just to write down the entire vector. Um, and now if we're going to use like Gaussian elimination, let's say, to find x, you know, we probably need even more than linear time. Um, you know, maybe in some cases we can get things to work in close to linear time. But um, you know, if we're going to produce a complete description of x, just to write it out, we're going to need at least linear time. Okay, but now the idea um, you know, that we want to consider here is what if we change the model? So now our goal is not to produce an explicit description of X, but rather to prepare a quantum state that's proportional to the solution. So it's proportional to A inverse acting on B. And what we're going to imagine, um, you know, so that we have the, the possibility of doing this efficiently, is that we're given um, you know, two things. We're given the ability to prepare a quantum state proportional to the right-hand side of this system of, of equations. So it's like a state of log n qubits. Um, and the matrix is somehow nice. So, you know, one, one sense in which it could be nice is that it's a sparse matrix. So there's not too many non-zero entries in the matrix. And you can work out for any given row um, or column where all those non-zero entries are and what the values are in those positions where the matrix is non-zero. That's, there's a more general class of, of you know, uh, uh, sort of a more general situation in which you might be able to handle A, there's this, uh, you know, kind of nice framework of what's called block encodings. So if you know about that, that's maybe a sort of more general and, and perhaps nicer way to think about the, the A's that you can handle. Um, but if you want a sort of very concrete picture, you can think about A being, you know, sparse uh, in this in this kind of row and column sense. Okay, so what this, uh, you know, uh, paper of Harrow, Hasidim, and Lloyd showed is that, it, you know, under these kinds of assumptions that you have this kind of encoding of the, of the linear system, then um, you can indeed produce a quantum state proportional to the solution um, in time uh, that scales like this. So it's, it's polynomial in the number of qubits that it takes to write down the vector, right? So polynomial in the log of the um, size of the system. Um, it's gonna scale polynomially in the inverse of the error with which you try to approximate this normalized state. And um, It'll also be polynomial in a, a sort of important quantity for these algorithms, which is the condition number, which is some kind of measure of sort of how um, you know close to singular the uh, system might be. So you know this this is not even a sort of well defined thing to do if a is not invertible, and if a has a really small eigenvalue compared to you know its its sort of overall scale, its you know spectral norm, then um, you might imagine that this would be hard, right? So this condition number somehow measures the sort of like. Um, you know, distance from singularity in, in some sense. But if the matrix is reasonably well conditioned, so this condition number kappa is not too large, um, then this algorithm runs in sort of a reasonable amount of time. Um, so I'm not going to talk in detail about how this algorithm works here, but let me just say sort of at a high level, um, you know, it's based on Hamiltonian simulation. So the idea is to, is to do phase estimation on, um, you know, sort of the dynamics generated by A. So you can think about A as the, the Hamiltonian of a quantum system. If it's not a Hermitian matrix, there's sort of a little trick uh, that you can use to sort of, you know, instead use a, a related matrix that is Hermitian that's gonna have the right sort of spectral information. But basically what you can do is you can estimate the eigenvalues of A using quantum phase estimation um, and then replace each eigenvalue by its inverse. Um, now that's not an invertible 
um, sorry, that's not a, a um, you know, unitary thing to do, right? Sort of, um, you know, this, this matrix one over A is not a unitary transformation uh, in general. But what you can show is that you can do this in sort of a post-selected way um, without sort of paying too high a price, provided the condition number is, is not too large. Okay, so this is a way of, um, you know, uh, producing this quantum state. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of the, the output of this algorithm. Um, now, there have been a bunch of sort of later improvements to make the complexity of this algorithm better. Let me not sort of dwell in the details. We're not really going to need them for the purposes of this talk, but let me just say that there's been, you know, a fair bit of work to try to understand this task and, you know, what's the sort of best possible complexity for it. Okay, so the idea of, of this talk is to, is, you know, not just to think about systems of linear equations, but systems of differential equations. Um, so ultimately, we're interested in nonlinear differential equations, but to get things started, let me, let me just, you know, talk about the, the situation with linear differential equations, which is uh, a bit simpler. Okay, so imagine we have some system of linear ordinary differential equations. Um, you know, here they're sort of like, I'm, I'm imagining they're like, um, uh, you know, first order equations, so there's no higher, higher order derivatives with respect to t. You could always sort of rewrite things so that, so that they have this form, uh, you know, maybe introducing some additional variables. Um, so, so the system is like, you know, dx dt is some square matrix A acting on x, possibly plus some inhomogeneous term. Um, and then we're given some initial condition, you know, x of zero, and we want to determine x of t at some time t. Right. So this is, I mean, actually, the, the uh, you know, Hamiltonian simulation problem that we already talked about is, of course, a special case of this where, you know, A is like an anti-Hermitian matrix. It's like minus I times the Hamiltonian and B is zero. Right. But we're just considering some generalization of that. OK, so, um, you know, we can handle these more general, uh, you know, not necessarily unitary uh, ordinary differential equations. Um, by making, making use of the quantum linear systems algorithm that I just uh, you know, described in the last slide. And this idea of applying that algorithm to, uh, you know, to uh, differential equations, to linear differential equations was first uh, worked out in this paper by Dominic Barry in 2014. So the kind of main idea of this algorithm is, um, you know, first of all, to approximate the solution of the system of differential equations by the solution of a system of linear equations. So basically, if you kind of discretize time with some kind of finite difference approximation, you get a, a system of linear equations that in the limit that you slice time you know, sufficiently finely will give you a good approximation of the you know, continuous time dynamics of this, of this system of differential equations. And then you know, once you've done that, sort of all you have to do is uh, you know, kind of work out the error analysis, right? So you need to understand like, you know, how much error is introduced, you know, through this, through this uh, time slicing, um, you know, what is going to be the condition number of this linear system as a function of parameters uh, of the, um, you know, underlying differential equations, you know, how likely is the final measurement in this process to succeed so that you actually get the uh, desired final state. So you can sort of work out all of these things. And it's really just a matter of kind of, you know, um, yeah, working out these parameters that describe the complexity of this quantum linear systems algorithm. Um, now, when you do this, you know, all of these caveats that I mentioned before about only producing the solution as a quantum state, you know, and, and needing this, the appropriate sort of implicit description of the, of the system, um, you know, all of these caveats still apply, right? So, um, you know, in particular, we only produce a quantum state encoding, encoding the, the final vector, which is not the same thing as, as, you know, writing down a list of all of the entries uh, of that vector. So it's not the same thing, but you could imagine that just as, you know, performing, uh, you know, measurements on a, on a quantum state can give you useful information about, you know, what's going on with that quantum system. Uh, again, you could measure some, you know, local observables or measure some, you know, measure some properties of the quantum state um, through some kind of efficient quantum processing uh, that would allow you to learn things about it that would be, you know, potentially hard to learn uh, classically. Now, one issue that I want to mention, because it's going to come up again in the algorithms for nonlinear differential equations that we're going to talk about in just a bit, is that, uh, you know, it's important for this algorithm to be efficient that the norm of the solution does not decay too fast. Um, you know, it can't decay sort of exponentially in time because, so, you know, imagine that somehow, you know, so, so now we're considering, you know, if we have like Schrodinger dynamics, right, then the, the solution doesn't decay, right, because the dynamics are unitary. But in general, you know, for a, for a system of differential equations like this, we can have, you know, dissipation, right? The, you know, part, components of the solution can decay and, and indeed potentially the entire solution uh, can decay. Um, so, you know, what, but what we're asking to do here is to produce a normalized quantum state 
proportional to the solution at the end of the evolution. So if you would if you would allow a situation where somehow the solution could, could decay exponentially, could decay to some exponentially small vector, some vector of exponentially small norm, but then you're asking to prepare a normalized quantum state that's proportional to that vector, you know, that's basically allowing you to post-select on exponentially small, uh, you know, exponentially unlikely events to somehow boost back up the solution, you know, despite the fact that it's decayed to this exponentially small thing. Um, and the ability to do that in general, to sort of post-select on, you know, possibly very small amplitudes, um, you know, allows you to solve really hard problems. Like it would allow you to solve NP-hard problems. And in fact, even more than that, it would allow you to solve what are called, you know, PP-hard problems. So um, somehow it's, it's, you know, this is not something that we expect to be able to do efficiently from sort of complexity theoretic considerations. Um, so, you know, it shouldn't be possible in general uh, to simulate these dynamics if they happen to make the solution decay away exponentially. So in the sort of analysis of the complexity of these procedures, you know, there's going to be a condition that says, well, you know, the, um, the algorithm can only be efficient if this doesn't happen, if, this, if the solution doesn't decay too much. But given that the solution doesn't decay too much, you know, then you can have an al algorithm that's efficient as a function of, you know, various uh, kind of, you know, parameters of the, of the system of differential equations. Okay, so there's been actually, you know, by now quite a bit of work on quantum algorithms for various kinds of linear differential equations that, in, that you know, cover other things, you know, not sort of described here, like the case where you have, you know, time dependent coefficients, or where you're considering boundary value problems instead of initial value problems. Uh, you know, there's been a bunch of work specifically on understanding the case of linear partial differential equations, you know, where we have derivatives with respect to space, you know, if we want to, if we want to consider, you know, the Maxwell equations or you know something something like this. Um, so there's there's you know a lot of a lot of sort of work on um, you know uh, understanding the performance of these algorithms in various uh, you know different kinds of situations. And we have now you know I would say you know pretty efficient algorithms that apply that apply to a pretty um, wide variety of cases. You know when we have different kinds of you know linear differential equations. Okay. Um, so, but now what we'd like to talk about, and this is sort of like the kind of main main topic of this um, of this talk, is the case of nonlinear differential equations, right? So now, what happens if we have a system of differential equations um, that is not linear? So I think this is a natural kind of thing to ask because. You know, um, uh, there are many situations in physics where, uh, and, and sort of other areas too, where uh, things are described by uh, nonlinear dynamics, you know, where there are nonlinear differential equations that, that describe uh, situations of interest. Um, so we would like to be able to handle them. And in fact, this was um, like one of the very early things that people thought about, um, you know, when they first started thinking about quantum algorithms for differential equations. In fact, even before this paper of Dominic Berry, like, uh, you know, maybe in the same month as the, this paper uh, that, that Harrow, uh, Hassadim, and Lloyd came out, there was this paper by Leighton and Osborne um, where they tried to consider this problem, you know, exactly this problem we're talking about now of um, producing a quantum encoding of the solution of a system of nonlinear differential equations. They, so they sort of went, you know, right away for sort of this, uh, this harder case of the general, you know, possibly uh, nonlinear, um, you know, systems of differential equations. Um, and so their goal was, you know, as, as we've been sort of discussing, to be able to, you know, by giving a quantum encoding of the solution using only like, you know, log n qubits to represent an n-dimensional state, um, to get an algorithm that would handle these nonlinear differential equations with complexity that's only polynomial in the log of the number of equations. Um, and indeed, they managed to do that, actually. They gave an algorithm that had complexity that was polynomial uh, in the log of n, where we have n-dimensional equations. But there's a sort of serious um, you know, drawback of their approach, which is that the complexity of their method is exponential in the amount of time t that you want to evolve for. And that means that basically, like, you, you can't let these equations do anything interesting. I mean, like, somehow, you know, um, uh, if you want to evolve for any significant amount of time at all, the complexity is just going to be um, sort of, you know, absurdly large, and you won't actually be able to run the algorithm, right? So, I mean, it's sort of not useful to have an algorithm uh, whose complexity is exponential in the amount of time you want to evolve the equations for. But, I mean, it's, it was sort of a, you know, a first step. Okay, so the main idea that they that they used, and actually an idea that's going to show up again in in the work that I'm going to tell you about in a bit, um, is to use multiple copies of the solution to represent the the nonlinearities, right? So you can imagine that um, if you have like multiple copies of the solution, well, while the equations might be you know might be nonlinear in the sort of elementary variables, if you can introduce the variables more than once, well, the sort of equations can be linear in you know two copies of the of the um, 
you know, so for example, if you have a quadratic nonlinearity, right, that's going to be something that's effectively uh, linear in two copies of the of the solution. And so, you know, that's something that you can do, just sort of, you know, maintain multiple copies of the solution, uh, you know, and try to use that to, um, uh, you know, through some sort of linear equation, so through some sort of linear process to, um, you know, produce this representation of the solution of this system of nonlinear differential equations. Um, and so that's what they did, but the sort of, the problem with this approach is that these copies are used up as you evolve. So somehow, you know, they, they, they need to sort of like, um, you know, um, you know, go through some sort of post-selected procedure as in the sort of algorithm for um, even for linear differential equations that I was describing before, because the dynamics are not necessarily, you know, unitary. They have to go through some post-selected procedure to move the dynamics forward. So that means they're using up um, the, the state. And so you're going to need, you're going to sort of use up these, these extra copies. Uh, you're going to need more of them. Um, you might think, well, let's just make a copy. But of course, you know that that's not possible, right? So in quantum mechanics, there's this no cloning theorem uh, that says that you can't uh, you know, you can't take a, an unknown quantum state and, and copy it. So, um, you know, because of that, you, you, you would need to sort of maintain all of the copies throughout the entire course of the algorithm. And since these, uh, you know, uh, copies are being steadily used up, you would actually, there would actually be exponential overhead. You know, it's basically like every time you want to evolve forward, you have to sort of turn two states into one. Um, and so you're going to need an exponential number of states uh, at the outset if you want to be able to sort of get all the way to uh, some final time t. So that's a that's a problem, but I mean that's you know that's the source of this of this exponential overhead in their in their algorithm you know, basically. Okay, so so that's kind of it's kind of a shame, but at the same time, like maybe maybe it's just inevitable, right? Maybe that's just sort of the best you can hope for. I mean, in particular, we know that nonlinear dynamics can be you know can just be hard to simulate in general, and you know one one setting in which I've seen this before, and, and maybe um, you know you're familiar with it as well, is that um, if you consider sort of a, a variant of quantum mechanics that's not linear, that includes some kind of nonlinear uh, term, then actually you can use those nonlinear, um, you know, modifications of quantum theory to rapidly so solve hard problems. So this was shown in some old work of, you know, Abrams and Lloyd that, for example, you could solve the unstructured search problem, or, you know, then you could use this to solve like NP hard problems, you know, really quickly by taking advantage of a nonlinearity, you know, if, if you had some like nonlinear variant of quantum mechanics. So, you know, to me, like this is, this is maybe more of a, this is not a sort of like, uh, you know, an opportunity to like find a nonlinearity non -linearity in quantum mechanics and then use that to solve hard problems. Rather, this is like some kind of, you know, evidence that quantum mechanics should really be linear, right? Because, you know, otherwise it would let you do this outrageous thing. And, and indeed we think, you know, quantum mechanics is, is a linear theory. So anyway, so, you know, this kind of suggests that like these, these nonlinearities, um, you know, since they can be very computationally powerful, well, that means that, they, that simulating them should be a computationally hard thing, right? So maybe that's a reason why, you know, you know, something like this, you know, maybe is just inevitable, right? Maybe somehow there's some fundamental obstacle um, that just prevents us from, from having efficient algorithms for nonlinear dynamics. And in a sense, I think that that's true. I mean, I think if you consider sort of two general, you know, a sort of fully general class of, of nonlinear dynamics, then um, it, it is just fundamental that somehow you can't, you can't hope to simulate them efficiently in general. Um, but of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that there couldn't be efficient algorithms for, you know, some cases, uh, and, and perhaps even for, you know, fairly broad cases, as long as we identify, you know, a feature that allows us to, uh, you know, have, a, have an efficient algorithm, right? To sort of, you know, focus on some particular kind of dynamics uh, for which a simulation really can be done efficiently. And so that's kind of the main contribution, I think, of our work to sort of identify um, a situation under which you actually can have an efficient algorithm and, and where you can get around this issue of the, the complexity growing exponentially as a function of time. Okay, so here's a sort of statement of the problem that we address. Uh, this is maybe a little bit more sort of detailed and formal than it needs to be, so apologies for that, but um, I think maybe this will help to sort of say in a really precise way, uh, you know, what exactly is the, is the problem that we're able to address in this work. So um, we're going to consider specifically quadratic differential equations. You can imagine sort of having, you know, higher... Um, you know, higher, uh, you know, degree nonlinearities and, and uh, dealing with them e either, you know, in a similar way or maybe by sort of reducing them to this form. Um, but just to keep things simple, let's imagine it's quadratic. Um, and so now our system of differential equations will have the following form. So, you know, u here is, a, is an n-component vector. 
Um, and DUDT is like, so there can be some, you know, we allow even a time dependent, uh, um, you know, uh, driving term sort of inhomogeneity. And then there's a linear piece. So F1 here is an N by N matrix. And then this is the, the quadratic nonlinear piece. And the way that it's represented here is really through this idea of having two copies of the solution that, you know, is sort of an idea in the algorithm, but here it's, it's, it's just an idea that's used to write down what the problem even is, right? So you can think about sort of a polynomial nonlinearity as this sort of, you know, n by n squared matrix acting on this, you know, n squared dimensional vector that, that stores two copies of the, of the solution, right? So this is the, this is the nonlinear term. And now what we imagine is that we're given sort of suitable, you know, black boxes that allow us to sort of understand like where the non-zero entries of these of these matrices are. Let me not sort of get into all the details about how exactly these things are encoded, but you have some suitable, you know, implicit description of the, the system of differential equations. Um, and then we're going to sort of impose a condition, which is that the system has to be dissipative. Um, and what I mean by that, you know, very, very concretely is that the, so F1 here represents the sort of linear, um, you know, part of the of the dynamics. And so F1 should have, um, you know, the eigenvalues of, of F1 should be, um, their, their real parts should all be negative, right? So, so these are going to correspond to sort of like, uh, you know, dissipate, uh, um, you know, a dissipative contribution to the, to the dynamics. And in particular, the, you know, the, the least negative of those eigenvalues still has to be bounded away from zero. And that's going to capture sort of like how dissipative the system is. Like this thing should not be too close to zero for the algorithm to be efficient. And specifically, we're going to measure that sort of relative to the nonlinearity and the driving term um, in terms of this, this quantity that we call R, right? So R is this ratio is some kind of measure of sort of how dissipative the system is relative to its um, you know, nonlinear term and its driving term. Um, and our goal um, will be to you know, find a quantum state to produce you know, on our quantum computer a quantum state that's proportional to the solution of this system of, of nonlinear differential equations uh, you know, running for, for some time capital T. And we really want to do that with a complexity that's you know, ideally um, polynomial in T, right? not exponential in T. Okay, so this parameter R is going to be really crucial. As I said, it somehow you know, quantifies the strength of the nonlinearity relative to the dissipation. Well, also there's this contribution from the, the sort of driving term here in the, in the numerator. Um, and you can think about it as being sort of qualitatively similar to the, to the Reynolds number, you know, which is some, is some kind of measure for fluid flow of like kind of how strong the nonlinear effects are. Okay, so... Um, let me sort of describe, um, you know, our, our kind of two main results about this problem. Uh, you know, one of these results is an algorithmic result saying that we, we can actually, you know, approach this problem uh, and, and give an efficient algorithm in some regime. And the other result is a kind of a hardness result saying we don't expect to be able to, um, you know, handle, we don't expect to be able to give an efficient algorithm in some other regime. So, okay, so let me describe the algorithmic result first. Um, so, so what we what we do is we give an algorithm that's efficient, provided this parameter r is less than one. Okay, so we say if r is less than one, there's a quantum algorithm for this problem um, that has complexity that's um, like ab about quadratic in t, the amount of time you want to evolve for. So this is much better than exponential in t, um, and it also scales with like some measure of the, the sparsity of the problem. Um, it scales, you know, polynomially in the log of n. So n here is the, like the dimension of the of the system, the number of variables. Um, it scales like one over the error, so it scales polynomially in the, in the inverse error. Um, and it also scales with this, with this parameter Q that tells us how the solution decays, right? So, so Q is like the sort of, you know, how much, how much um, uh, smaller the norm of the solution is at time t, you know, relative to the initial solution, right? So if there, if there were like exponential decay of the solution, then this quantity Q would be exponentially large, and then the algorithm actually would not be efficient. Um, but we could be in a situation where this Q was like only polynomially uh, large, and in that case, the algorithm could actually be efficient. Okay. And this, and this, you know, condition, as I as I sort of mentioned before, is really necessary because you know if this can if this quantity is exponentially small, then you can post select and you can solve you know really hard problems. So we really don't expect to be able to handle that kind of a case efficiently. Okay, so uh, you know, I really don't have time to sort of go through the full analysis of this algorithm, certainly, but let me just say what some of the main ingredients are, and I'm going to talk about one of them a little bit more on the next slide. Um, so the kind of key technical idea, I would say, to get this um, you know, into something that we can approach with the quantum linear system algorithm is this thing called Karlman linearization. So this is a, a method that I'll describe on the next slide, um, which, is, which is actually quite an old idea, um, that allows you to rewrite a system of nonlinear differential equations 
uh, in terms of a larger system of linear differential equations. And actually, to, to sort of exactly capture the nonlinear differential equations, you would need a system of infinitely many uh, linear differential equations. But you can truncate that to a finite system and um, understand sort of like, you know, um, as a function of where you truncate, how much error do you introduce? And that's, you know, we, we, we give some kind of new uh, sort of analysis of, of that uh, truncation that's kind of like a, a kind of a core technical part of the result. And then the rest of the stuff is kind of straightforward, sort of the way you would handle, you know, linear differential equations, you know, you sort of discretize the linear differential equations in time, and then you sort of just have to have to work out sort of the complexity of the kind of standard tools that you apply uh, to the, the um, to use the, the quantum linear systems algorithm to produce the desired quantum state. Okay, let me say a little bit about um, Carleman linearization, uh, because as I said, this is kind of like the kind of key technical idea. So as I was saying, the idea is to um, you know, approximate this system of nonlinear differential equations by an infinite sequence of linear differential equations. Um, and these will be, you know, these, these uh, linear equations will have sort of variables that represent you know, multiple copies of the solution. So the same idea that I've, that I've sort of mentioned a few times already, you know, we have sort of one copy, two copies, three copies, et cetera. Um, and, you know, to, as I was saying, like to exactly capture the, the you know, nonlinear dynamics, you would actually need to sort of keep going forever, right? You would need to have, um, you know, arbitrarily many, uh, you know, numbers of copies of the, of the solution. So to sort of, um, you know, show you in a simple example what's going on, let's think about the scalar case where, you know, instead of this being, a, you know, in general, this is like an n component vector, but let's imagine n equals one. So it's just a scalar, right? Then u tensor two is just u squared, right? U tensor three is just u cubed, et cetera. Um, so, and let's think about a quadratic nonlinearity. So we have like, this is our kind of general, you know, nonlinear differential equation, like du dt is au squared plus bu plus c. Okay. All right. So the idea to sort of try to make this, you know, to sort of linearize this is, you know, let's say that u squared is, you treat u squared as like an independent variable, right? If we would sort of treat u squared as an independent variable, then this is, you know, this is linear, right? It, you, it's, it's like, this is a linear expression in sort of well, there's a constant term and there's u, but then if we think of u squared as like some other thing, um, you know, then this is now this is now linear. The only issue is that we we don't we don't have a system of differential equations we can solve because we need to know what's the time derivative of u squared, right? But of course we can do that, right? Just that's just like you know kind of simple calculus, right? So so using this equation we can work out what is du squared dt. We just use the kind of standard rules for the derivative, right? And and so it's two times u times du dt. Um, and we, we have an equation for du dt, so we can substitute that in, right? So we just kind of plug this in over here and we get, you know, this expression, right? And so now we have, you know, we have, an ex we have sort of an expression for the dynamics of u squared, okay? But, you know, we're not done because now we've got this thing u cubed and, you know, that's not linear in the variables that we have so far, u and u squared. So um, we need to sort of either think about that as a nonlinear contribution from the product of u and u squared, um, or the cube of u, let's say. Um, but that's not what we want to do. We want to keep things linear. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, that's another variable, right? Okay, but now we need a, an equation for the dynamics of u cubed. So we keep going, right? We can, we can sort of do the same kind of thing again. But of course, you're always going to have something left over every time you do this, right? You, you're, you're never going to be able to stop after a finite number of steps. Um, so, um, but what you can do is you can just truncate. You can just sort of like imagine that that thing is zero, you know, once, once you get to some certain point. Um, and then you've got some system of, of linear differential equations that doesn't exactly capture the situation, but maybe if you did, you know, maybe if you went far enough, you got a reasonably good approximation. So that's the kind of idea of this uh, Carlman linearization procedure. Um, and so, you know, if you do this in general for the sort of like vector valued case, what you get is a system of linear differential equations that look, looks like this, where here the variables are these yj's, these are like n component, well, sorry, I mean, yj, I guess, is like an n to the j component factor, y1 is an n component factor, um, and yj like sort of stands in for j copies of the solution, right? So like if you would, if you would solve things perfectly, then y would be, you know, this tensor power state that's just, you know, n, j, j copies of the, of the solution. Um, and so you get this kind of block tridiagonal structure, um, you know, if you sort of do the analog of this thing, uh, you know, in the kind of vector case where these sort of like matrices that appear in the blocks depend on these, you know, uh, matrices F1, uh, F2, and F0 um, that, you know, describe the, the underlying differential equation. Okay, so that's the, that's the Carleman linearization procedure. And then to sort of understand how this works, 
you need to know what is the effect of truncating, right? I mean, here we've truncated at level kind of capital N, we've just sort of cut things off. Um, and, you know, that that's going to introduce some error, you know, what is the effect of that going to be? Um, so what you can show is that the error, the level that you truncate at to get a given error doesn't have to increase too rapidly with various parameters of the problem. Uh, in particular, you know, we show that if you take n to scale like the log of the amount of time you want to evolve for and like, you know, one over the error you want to allow and well, you know, the full expression is this, um, you know, then then that's a large enough value of capital N that you get, you know, the, the solution within some error delta that you're aiming for. And so we can sort of understand like where is an okay place to truncate so that we get um, you know a good approximation of the solution. Okay, so that's sort of like the sort of main main idea behind the algorithm. There's a lot of sort of uh, error analysis to work out, but that's um, those are sort of some of the main ideas. Okay, so um, let me go on and talk a little bit about the kind of the lower bound result. So you know we we have these results showing that. You know, if R is less than one, so there's sort of sufficiently strong dissipation to kind of keep the nonlinearity in check, then we can give an efficient algorithm. But of course, we would really like to be able to handle, you know, potentially like cases with strong nonlinearities, because, you know, somehow the effect of the nonlinearities could be, you know, probably more interesting if you have really strong nonlinear uh, terms. Um, but then again, I mean, if that's not possible, you know, we should know that that's not possible. So that's, that's what we show through the second result. We show kind of an, imp an impossibility result. Um, if R is, is big. And in particular, we show a bound that's like actually pretty close to, to the behavior of our algorithm. Um, so, um, you know, there are, there are previous results that are sort of of, of this kind that I mentioned before, sort of about the hardness of simulating nonlinear quantum mechanics, right? But nonlinear quantum mechanics is like not a sort of dissipative theory, right? You can set up sort of a nonlinear variant of quantum mechanics where the state always remains normalized, even though it's evolving in some nonlinear way. Whereas for the, the you know, uh, algorithm that, that we described you know, in the previous couple of slides, um, it's really crucial that there is some dissipation, right? So um, you know, if we consider a situation with no dissipation, sure, we know that that's hard because of these kinds of results, but what about situations of the kind that we're actually talking about where there is some dissipation? Well, it turns out that you can, you can show this provided you have enough dissipation, and actually you don't need very much to be able to show that the problem is computationally hard. Um, so in particular, we showed this problem is hard if R is bigger than the square root of two. So for any value of R, which is at least the square root of two, we can show that there's an instance of this you know, quadratic ODE problem as we formulated it, um, such that any quantum algorithm you know, that can solve it sort of you know, in general um, will have to have worst case complexity exponential in capital T. Right? So somehow the thing that, thing that we did for R equals one, like maybe we could do it for R equals 1.01, we don't know but we definitely can't do it at the same level of generality that we did it for R equals 1.5, right? Because, you know, that would be into this R bigger than the square root of two regime. Okay, so let me just say very briefly what the kind of main ingredients are that go into this result. Um, you know, it has to do with sort of the hardness of distinguishing non-orthogonal quantum states, right? If we have two quantum states that are very close to each other, it should be hard to distinguish them. You know, we, we shouldn't be able to, with, with sort of just one copy of the, of the state, we shouldn't be able to tell which of the two we have um, with very high probability, just making a measurement. And even if we have many copies of the states, well, we should really need a very large number of copies of the states to distinguish them if the states, the two potential states we're trying to distinguish are very close to each other. Um, and uh, sort of other sort of feature that we use is that um, nonlinear dynamics can allow you to rapidly distinguish non-orthogonal states, right? So whereas if you have unitary dynamics, you know, then if you had two states that, well, they make some small inner product, you know, unitary dynamics preserve the inner product. So the thing can rotate around, but like pushing this, the two possible states around, it doesn't help you to distinguish them because inner products are preserved. But if the dynamics are nonlinear, then states that are initially close to each other can get pried apart. Right, that's one of the things that can happen. It's, it's somehow a very characteristic thing that can happen in nonlinear dynamics. Um, and so, if we sort of quantify how fast you can do that, um, we can say something about uh, sort of how hard it ought to be to simulate the nonlinear dynamics. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have a slide here where I sort of explain something about the hardness of state distinguishability, but maybe let me not go through this in in sort of full detail. I mean, uh, basically, if you have you know, if you have quantum states that have sort of a high overlap, then you should need a lot of number of a lot of copies to distinguish them. So if the overlap is like one minus epsilon, you can show you need a number of copies that goes like one for epsilon. And this is just kind of standard, um, you know, kind of quantum information uh, sorts of arguments. Let me not let me not maybe dwell on the details unless there are questions about it. Um, but then let me sort of uh, mainly say that that um, 
you know, something about how you could distinguish states using nonlinear uh, dynamics. And in fact, even using dissipative nonlinear dynamics. Um, so, uh, you know, to be really concrete, let's imagine that we, um, you know, consider the following like scalar nonlinear differential equation. So this is just like du dt is minus u plus r times u squared. So this coefficient r, it's like the, you know, the, the coefficient in front of this quadratic nonlinearity, this really is the parameter r as I described it before, right? It's the ratio of the strength of the nonlinearity which you know before we measured in terms of like the spectral norm of some matrix characterizing the nonlinearity, but here it's I mean it's just a scalar, um, so that that characterizes the strength of the nonlinearity, and then the the sort of strength of the dissipation is is one right it's dissipative because we've got a minus sign, um, but the sort of strength of this term is you know the magnitude of that coefficient is one, so R is really the ratio of the like the, the sort of nonlinearity to the to the um, dissipation, okay. Um, and now, what is the solution of this equation? Well, the solution of this equation, I mean, certainly like, you know, the scale of things kind of depends on R, but um, it has some exponential decay as a function of the evolution time t. I mean, you know, in general, it's like hard to write down the solution of nonlinear differential equations, but this is a very simple one for which you can actually just write down an exact solution, and this is what it is. Okay. So um, now what we're going to do is we're going to consider a situation where we have just like a two-dimensional system we're trying to evolve, and we're going to let the same dynamics act on both basis states of a qubit, right? So both of the computational basis states are evolving according to these nonlinear dynamics, right? Obviously, this is not like, you know, legitimate quantum dynamics, but it's some nonlinear dynamics that we could that we could sort of effectively implement by running our quantum, you know, quadratic ODE solver, you know, if we had the ability to do that. OK, so suppose we do this on an, an initial state, which is prepared in the uniform superposition of the two computational basis states, right? So if, we're, if we start out in this plus state, that state is not going to evolve because we're, you know, the dynamics act in the same way on the two coefficients, and the two coefficients are initially the same. So they're both going to evolve in exactly the same way, and the state is going to remain uh, you know, this, in this plus state like once you renormalize it. Actually, if you set the parameters in just the right way, you can make it so it literally remains exactly the state. But uh, anyway, it certainly doesn't evolve up to normalization. OK, but now suppose we deviate from that by a little bit, right? Suppose we rotate away by some angle, uh, you know, theta, so that the two amplitudes now are like cosine pi over 4 plus theta and sine pi over 4 plus theta for the 0 state and the 1 state, right? So now one of them is a little bit bigger than 1 over the square root of 2, and one of them is a little bit smaller than 1 over the square root of 2. And so now they're going to change relative to each other. And in fact, they're going to sort of deviate from each other sort of in an, in an exponentially growing way because of this e to the t, right? So here, um, just to like show you a concrete example with some numbers, um, here's what happens when we take r to be the square root of 2 and we rotate away by like, you know, 1%. Um, OK, so then initially, you know, at time 0, like, so this blue line is, is just 1 over the square root of 2, right? So that's like what would happen if we just prepared in the plus state. But now if we have this small rotation, then one of the amplitudes that like the green one is a little bit bigger and the orange one is a little bit smaller, right? And so initially they're extremely close because theta is extremely small, but they're gonna, they're gonna sort of deviate exponentially, right? So as a function of T, um, these things are going to sort of, um, you know, uh, one is gonna grow uh, exponentially in T and the other is gonna decay exponentially in T. I mean, of course, only up to a point because eventually like, you know, they'll, they'll be very far from each other and can't go on forever, but, um, uh, you know, in this, in this, um, you know, in the amplitudes of this kind of like normalized state, I mean, they can sort of really deviate from each other very, very fast. So that even if the the initial amplitudes are really close to each other, it doesn't take a lot of time for them for them to become very, very different. And you know, to make that a little bit more concrete, what you in terms of the, the asymptotic scaling, what you can show is that the time to separate states that have initial overlap, like one minus epsilon, um, scales like log one over epsilon. Right, so because of this exponential divergence of these of these uh, amplitudes, okay. So this, you know, um, sort of allows you to show that somehow, you know, already when R is at least the square root of two, um, you know, this problem should be should be computationally hard, right? If you could sort of distinguish these really these really, um, uh, you know, close states, then you could. Well, that's something you shouldn't be able to do in quantum mechanics. Among other things, you could use it to solve hard computational problems. And so, you know, what that really means is that there just cannot be an efficient algorithm for this problem in this, like, you know, strongly nonlinear regime. Okay, so um, those are sort of the two main um, uh, sort of theoretical results. And what I want to do in the last bit of the talk is just, um, you know, talk a little bit about some potential applications of the of the algorithm before I uh, before I wrap up. Okay, so the first, uh, you know, application um, 
that you maybe might might think about, um, you know, here is to like uh, epidemiology, right? So this is this is an application that's particularly relevant, I guess, to our uh, our current lives. Um, so you know, you could imagine that if you want to model the dynamics of some population, you know, in a pandemic, um, that you could describe that by some nonlinear differential equations that describe the interaction of different, you know, pieces of a population. So this is a model. This is not like a model that we made up. This is actually like a model that's used by epidemiologists to model uh, to model pandemics. So I mean, the, the details re here really don't matter so much. But you know, you can imagine that you sort of divide up your population into different pieces. There's part that's maybe susceptible to some disease. You know, some part that's been exposed, some part that's been, uh, you know, actually infected, and then some part that maybe has recovered. Um, and you know, you can describe some sort of nonlinear interactions among these different pieces. Um, and uh, you know, then like uh, uh, you know, try to use the solutions of this of this differential equation to understand, uh, you know, what's going to happen in the in the pandemic. And uh, so there's a bunch of coefficients that sort of you know characterize the uh, the system, and um, so then you can ask sort of you know if you make realistic choices for these for these parameters like what's the value of this this parameter r that I described, um, and what you can show so this is a paper like um, you know a very recent paper where people use this model specifically to model the the sort of COVID nineteen pandemic, and what you can show is that if you take the sort of you know more or less realistic choices that they that they make in that uh, that they um, I guess you know use from sort of um, observations in that paper, but then you assume a fairly rapid rate of vaccination, which is maybe not quite realistic. Like you have to assume the vaccination happens maybe faster than than it actually does and and you know actually has in the real world, but um it, but is not totally unrealistic. Then you can be in this regime where R is less than one. So somehow um you know. I don't want to say that somehow, you know, we're going to use quantum computers to, to solve COVID-19, um, but rather what I want to say is that you can imagine a situation where, um, you know, the uh, sort of, uh, there's some nonlinear phenomenon that's of interest and, you know, it might still be of interest despite the fact that you're in, you're in, in a regime where things are not too strongly nonlinear. That you have, you know, some dissipation, and um, and uh, you know, you could be in this, you know, kind of weakly nonlinear regime and still care about the problem. Now, obviously, this model has only four parameters, right? So maybe we don't need a quantum computer to to you know have this log n scaling. Maybe it's not so useful. I mean, you could imagine, you know, caring about a higher dimensional version of this kind of a model where maybe you have different populations in many cities that interact with each other. You know, you could certainly imagine a situation in which you want to do something like this in a really high dimensional case. Um, I mean, again, I don't want to argue that this is like actually necessarily a useful thing to do, but just to sort of, you know, put this in the context of something that uh, maybe we're all um, living through right now. Okay, and then the other sort of um, application that I want to mention is is to sort of like fluid dynamics, right? So you could imagine trying to do this kind of thing for let's say the like the Navier-Stokes equations uh, to model fluid flow. Um, you know what we did in some in some numerical work was to um, look at a kind of toy version of that, this thing called the uh, the viscous Burgers equation, um, which is shown here. And you know we looked numerically to see in some you know attempt to to um, solve this equation using this Carlman linearization idea. Um, you know how how large a value of r can we actually handle, right? We know that if r is less than one, we have this kind of convergence result. But um, you know what we found, somewhat surprisingly, um, was that if we you know tried to use this Carleman linearization procedure to handle this equation, um, we would even get good convergence out to even much larger values of r. Like here, what's shown here is some you know uh, situation where the, the the value of r is more like forty. Uh, you know, much larger than R, definitely beyond the square root of two, where we know that there's hardness in general. But of course, the result that says there's hardness in general, um, if R is at least the square root of two, doesn't mean there can't be, you know, particular kinds of equations where maybe the algorithm would actually work well, even though R is much, much larger. Um, so that's a possibility. And we see some evidence for that from, from these kind of, you know, just classical numerics looking at using uh, Carleman, Carleman linearization, where already even with just like, you know, four levels of Carleman linearization, you get, you know, really quite good uh, approximation of the solution. So, you know, I think this is intriguing and I think it would be interesting to understand better, like if there are certain classes of, of um, you know, equations for which our, for which our um, algorithm even performs sort of, you know, better than our general analysis, um, you know, would suggest. Okay, so that's that's it for applications. So let me maybe just summarize and talk about some um, open questions here in the last couple of slides. Um, so just to kind of recap of what, what we've uh, what we've seen. So you know we described an algorithm that allows us to um, you know I wouldn't say solve a system of nonlinear differ differential equations, but rather produce this quantum encoding of the solution of a system of nonlinear differential equations, provided there's sufficiently strong dissipation. So we had this parameter r. 
that captures the, the problem and R should be less than one for our algorithm to be uh, efficient. Um, and there's also this condition that the solution, you know, should not decay exponentially. But given these conditions, we can give an algorithm that actually sort of, you know, efficiently, uh, uh, you know, produces this quantum state encoding the solution. Um, we know that this problem that we're solving is something that, you know, in, in its full generality is hard for classical computers, because even in the case where there's, where there's no dissipation, this problem is kind of as hard as anything a quantum computer could do, right? It's a BQP hard problem. So certainly we're doing something that's classically hard. Um, you know, it, it does come with these caveats, like for example, about the exponential decay, um, but this is something that we know somehow has to be there. So we're not too worried about that. Um, and, um, you know, one sort of point that I maybe should make is that um, it is important that there's not this, that there's not this, um, you know, exponential decay. And if we consider, um, you know, and you might worry about the fact that we, we require that there's dissipation. Right, so dissipation somehow is going to cause exponential decay, right, in general. Um, and in fact, if you don't have driving, um, then actually, like just in general, the equations will decay exponentially. And so the, the, the sort of long time complexity will be not efficient. Um, but we do allow for this case of sort of possibly time dependent driving. And when you have a driving term, you know, then, then um, you can have sort of these driven differential equations that don't decay exponentially, despite the fact that there's dissipation. So there really is a regime in which our algorithm, you know, kind of runs uh, in polynomial time. Okay. Um, and, you know, on the flip side, we have this hardness result that says that, you know, we can't, um, you know, we can't hope to have an efficient algorithm, at least in full generality, you know, in the kind of strongly nonlinear regime. Um, and then there's also this kind of evidence that I mentioned that maybe in some cases, you know, despite that general no-go result, you know, maybe in some specific cases, you actually can go sort of much deeper to much larger values of R. And I, I do think that's a thing that would be interesting to understand more. Um, so this is my last slide. Let me just wrap up with some open questions. Um, you know, um, there's some kind of like technical questions, right? So there's this little window between R equals one and R equals square root of two, or we haven't pinned down the kind of, you know, worst case hardness. I think it would be, you know, nice to just resolve that. Um, you know, our, our algorithm has complexity quadratic in T, there are reasons to think that it, it can't be better than linear in T, like that's the case already for, for quantum mechanics, that you can't give general Hamiltonian simulations, you know, in sublinear time. Um, but, you know, it's not clear that it sort of is necessary that it be quadratic, right? So it'd be interesting to see if that can be improved. Also, the dependence on the error, if you look at sort of the behavior of, of um, the complexity of quantum simulation algorithms, there's some possibility that that could be improved. Um, but yeah, I think maybe the sort of most interesting questions about this uh, sort of line of work are this thing that I mentioned about understanding whether there are some, you know, more strongly nonlinear equations for which the algorithm could actually be efficient, and more generally just sort of thinking about applications of these methods. I mean, you know, really what we've done in this work is to develop a kind of a, an algorithmic tool that you can try to apply if you have a, you know, fault tolerant quantum computer. Um, but you know, and I, I sort of paid lip service a little bit to some potential applications just to say that there's some things we can put in this context, but we re haven't really thought in a lot of detail about like how you would actually use this method to say something interesting about, you know, fluid flow or the dynamics of a pandemic or something like this. And so I think it would be, you know, great to think more about sort of like, you know, really making use of these algorithms to sort of study, um, you know, nonlinear phenomena. Okay, so um, yeah, thanks for your attention. Okay, thanks, Andrew, for this wonderful talk. And I think we uh, have like a few minutes to uh, yeah. questions. So, uh, yeah, I have a few questions, Andrew, mostly because I think I either didn't understand some of the points you made or, or worse, misunderstood them. Uh, first, uh, just a, a very simple question. The nonlinear part of it, part of what you told us, really has nothing to do with quantum computing, right? That's all Karlman, right? I mean, uh, basically a nonlinear differential equation can be converted to a sequence, infinite sequence of linear differential equation that comes from Karlman's algorithm. Yes. And then you have an algorithm or somebody has an algorithm to solve linear differential equation on quantum computer efficiently and you have put the two together. Am yeah, I correct on this or am I missing something? I'm no, no, that's right. That's right. Oh, I mean, good, it, you good. know, this Kalman thing is somehow just a kind of a mathematical idea, or you can think about it as yeah. a kind of a. No, no, no. This is good, but I just want to make sure I didn't miss anything. You uh, know, that's that's absolutely right. Okay. So next question is that 
And this is definitely misunderstanding. I thought you're talking about ODEs, and then you started talking about fluid and, and, and so on. Those are all partial differential equation. Should I worry about it at all, or it doesn't really matter in the context you are talking about? Right, yeah. So, I mean, basically to put those, you know, to put PDEs, and I think you can put PDEs in this context. I mean, basically you have to sort of take the, you know, you can imagine that you take the like, you know, spatial derivatives and you discretize them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just, it, I think it's just a matter of sort of, sort of technical stuff, kind of oh, dis okay, okay. Yeah. Now comes my main qu question, which is that often in nonlinear differential equations, particularly nonlinear partial differential equations, which I have worked a lot with, uh, maybe before you were even born, uh, more than 30 years ago, uh, there can be finite time singularities. I mean, singularity doesn't have to be something going to infinity but something going to, you know, 80 to the power 100 or something like that, like Berger's shock, but many other things, which often you do not know. Mm -hmm. Can Karlman's algorithm handle things like that? Because it seems that it will be very difficult for us to know how far I have to go. I mean, suddenly, you know, you're solving for X and then suddenly the solution is actually going as e to the power x. You see what I'm saying? I mean, right. uh, as you, you know, if you do a hop transformation, you often see it. So can what you told us right now handle a situation like this? I'm really curious. Well, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not 100% sure. I mean, there's, you know, there's sort of conditions under which the convergence analysis, um, you know, works. And maybe the conditions that maybe the sort of phenomena you're describing would occur sort of only when those conditions are not satisfied, right? So uh, like Berger's shock, for example, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe the whole thing will fail. Uh, because of some condition not being satisfied. I mean, that's kind of what I suspect, but I think- Yeah, I, I suspect that too. No, no, I, I think this is a good answer. Finally, just a comment, uh, because I, well, not I, Heining Pan really, but under, my, under my guidance, I did a lot of simulations of COVID early, in, the early, in the early days, okay? Uh -huh. I can tell you that ACIR is completely useless to tell us anything about any real endemic. I mean, it, it's absolutely good to write papers, but only when nothing is at stake. What I mean by that, I'm not being facetious. What I mean by that, the results depend so much on the input parameters, which are not known, right. that there is no point in doing it at all. I mean, this yeah, is something yeah. I know the hard way, having done it, okay? Yeah, I totally, I mean, I, I'm not at all surprised to hear this. I mean, I certainly don't know a lot about the subject. I mean, this is kind of why I was very quick to say, I, you know, uh, I don't know about the, the usefulness of doing this. And, and one yeah. reason for that is indeed the, uh, maybe uh, the model is just not a useful right. one to study. A much better model that we physicists do that is basically doing a discrete model, not on a lattice, but you know, you have a discrete number of houses, discrete number of uh, uh, cities, and you have some idea about the planes connecting them and, and so on and so forth. And just discrete mm -hmm. simulation, don't even try to take the continuum limit at all. That's, you know, not all discrete model, that's better. But but mm -hmm. I, I get the point. This is That's why I said this is just as an aside. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I think we are right on time. So- um, Is there room thanks. for a question? Uh, maybe a very, very short one, I think. Very short question. So what would happen if you had a mechanism for dissipation that is not linear, but purely nonlinear? An example would be in magnetics, the landau lifshitz equation with uh, uh, cubic non, uh, dissipation. Yeah, that's a very interesting question. I mean, the shorter answer is we haven't considered it. I mean, somehow intuitively, I would, I would expect that, that maybe you could make use of that kind of dissipation to get some kind of result, but it's like, it's definitely outside the scope of what we, you know, what our sort of like technical result shows. Thank you very much. Sure, yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, let's thank, thanks Andrew again for this wonderful talk and uh, I will pass on the chair to, to Danny. All right. Uh